Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves and the plow. And the five-string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to mybigfootsighting.com. My Bigfoot sightings help shape who I am and how I look at the world and nature around me. My first sighting, I was 15. It was the fall of 79 in cloudy Oklahoma. And first year I had got to go hunting with my dad and my brother. We got up at four that morning and ate breakfast and everything. And we got on our bikes and went down, oh, about two miles from camp. And we stopped at one place and hit our bikes. And my dad told me, he says, you go up in the stand. And he was going to go one way around this mountain and my brother was going to go the other way around the mountain. And hopefully they chase something up, you know, towards me. And I said, okay. So I shimmied up this tree into the tree stand. I was about 18 feet off the, off the ground and they took off and they told me that they were going to go a little ways and then stop and wait for the sun to come up. And then slowly make their way around and they'd see me in a few hours. So I'm sitting there in the tree and it's nice and dark. I can hear something behind me, you know, like digging around. But it didn't sound big. It kind of sounded like a coon or a possum. But nothing huge or anything. And I kind of looked over my shoulder and I didn't see anything. And it was still pretty dark. Well, the sun started coming up, and it was so cold, and I'm sitting there in the tree and trying to be quiet and everything, and I hear it digging behind me, and I'm going, maybe it's a squirrel or something. It just didn't sound very big, and I'm watching out from the way my father told me to to watch and everything, and I hear something take steps. And I thought, well, maybe it's one of them. They forgot something. And my father was a pretty good-sized guy. So as it's walking around, that's what I'm convincing myself was, okay, one of them forgot something. And it took about, I guess, about 15 minutes for it to get closer and closer. And because it sounded bipedal, I never thought about it being an animal. And so I'm just sitting up there in the tree real still and everything. And about the time it walks under the tree that I'm in, I said, Dad, what'd you forget? And I looked down. This animal underneath me looked up like, where did you come from? And it didn't turn its neck or anything, it kind of like leaned back and looked up where I was. And then it looked down and it kind of looked around, you know, to see if there was anything else around and back up at me and then looked the other way and looked up at me a third time and just kind of snorted, took off walking. I had my British 303 in my hand, never thought about shooting at it. The eyes on this thing, it was dark. There was no white in the eyes. It had a a flat nose. It was reddish brown hair. A little bit of a cone on its head. 
it wasn't, you know, like some people talk about it being a, a straight cone. And I felt like after it walked off that it could have just reached up and grabbed me. And it took me 15 minutes to stop shaking before I could get out of the tree. I finally got out of the tree and stood around there a few minutes and was trying to calm down. Finally got on my boater bike and went back to camp. And my father and my brother come in, oh, three or four hours later. And I told my dad what I seen. And he told me, he goes, oh, you just didn't want to sit in the tree. And I'm like, no, no, this is what I seen. And I described its hands. It was, had big hands, didn't have big claws or anything, you know, just, just nails, but they were dirty, I guess, from digging. And I'm trying to describe it. And he's just, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just starting something. I'd never told anybody else about this. And it always stayed in the back of my mind. I've had nightmares throughout the years of the eyes, just the eyes. I always read up on Bigfoot and, you know, things, you know, what they do and different reports on them and sightings and stuff like that. But I really didn't start looking for them and getting into research groups until, oh, the last eight or ten years. I lived in southeast Oklahoma all these years. And one morning, I was going to work down in Antlers, Oklahoma. And I seen something walk across the road in front of me just at the edge of my lights. And I kind of looked at it sideways. Of course, I just seen a flash of it going there. It was raining and everything. I never thought about it more. I was like, oh, you're just tired. It's the rain. But they were always in the back of my mind. Well, 15 years ago, I moved up close to Oklahoma City to start a new job and everything. And I had just got custody of my autistic granddaughter. And I bought a new place up here by the city. And I got a few acres and she always liked to play outside and everything. And she makes sounds. She's always making sounds. And even though she was, you know, older than kids that played in the dirt, she would sit down and play in the dirt. She was very childish. She still is. And one evening, I walked out on the porch to tell her, you know, supper was ready. And she's there playing in the in the dirt. And she hollered at me. And she said she had a new friend. And I said, what are you talking about? You got a new friend. She says, he's down there by the fence. And my house is probably, oh... A good 150 yards off the road, out a long driveway, and right at the edge of my property where the fence is and the gate is and everything, I could see eye shine and something standing there. Totally freaked me out. I went and grabbed her, brought her into the house, and spent the next few weeks trying to find out if these animals are in this area. Have they ever hurt a special need child? And trying to talk to anybody I could about it. Well, about a month later, I seen that there was a a bunch of the researchers was getting together and giving us talk about Bigfoot and everything. And it was it wasn't that far from the house. I'm like, I'm going to go to this. I went to it and listened and asked questions and brought up the point of, you know, have you ever heard of one of these animals hurting a special need child? And I was told 
that there's been a few of them over in Tennessee and Kentucky where parents of special need kids, especially autistic kids, have said that they have seen them watching the kids. The guy that was speaking told me he didn't really know if they were just trying to figure out the kids because these kids don't act like, you know, regular people because they act childish. They make noises. They dig in the dirt, you know, and things like that, which made sense. And I joined one of the groups to start looking around the area to see how big of a problem it was. Which just took me on a couple of adventures. We went down to do a overnight research down in far south, southeast Oklahoma, in the mountains. And I had, at 2 o'clock in the morning, something throw a rock at my tent. And then let out a real good howl right behind my tent. First time that happens, you want to talk about the hair stand up on your neck? <laughs> oh, I had a nine millimeter with me, but I wasn't walking out of that tent. Something was going to pull me out of that tent, but I wasn't walking out of that tent. <laughs> and the more and the more that I looked into these creatures and learned what I could, my thoughts are they're just trying to to live, to raise their young, to teach their young how to take care of themselves and how to stay out of the way of humans. One gentleman called me one night and asked would I go with him and show him some things. He had found some stuff and he didn't know what, you know, what it was and could I help him. And I said, okay, where do you want to meet at? He told me the address. It was less than five miles from downtown Oklahoma City. And it was a like a abandoned park, empty property type thing. They had a big creek down. It had a row of houses down one side. It had a row of stores down the other side. It was probably probably 30 acres in that spot overgrown it was so overgrown the grass was all grown up and he started pointing out trees you know what this is and what that is and i went no you can see how it's just been over so that could be straight wing there's not a whole lot you can say for that and then i walked a few feet and i said but you see how this one is grabbed and twisted straight winds won't do that you have to, you know that has to be twisted like that and he was old and really I said, yeah, and we started looking, and we found uh, four tracks and was walking around this property, and we, we were just kind of walking around the edges of it. And I was going, you know, I don't really see how they will have any food here in this area or anything. And we jumped three deer. I went, okay, never mind. And we're walking around, and there's this open place, and it's got real tall grass in it. And there's this huge stump over there. And I stop and I look at the stump and I'm like, wow, that's amazing looking. And even though I was taking hundreds of pictures, I never took a picture of the stump, which I wasn't within probably 50 feet of it. And we go ahead and continue walking around the edges of it and everything. And when we come over to where the line of stores are, you know, the high fence there that the stores put up there and their, their dumpsters are right there. For a good 30 feet from the fence back, there is all this trash, all these empty food packages, everything. And all the tree limbs that are over the fence the limbs have been stripped of any little bitty limbs or any leaves that are hanging out of it. I mean, they're just stripped limbs. I'm like, now that's really strange. And we continue to talk and point out things and walking around and everything. And we come all the way back around. And we wasn't but, oh, 
probably two acres from our vehicles, walking around the edges like we was. And I stopped and I went, this is that tall grass where we walked around that edge. He goes, yeah. I went, where did the stump go? This man left me standing there. <laughs> he ran. It was like, okay. So I just kind of slowly continued to watch around me and, and walk out. And when I get to my car, there's a couple there that's been walking around down the road. And I'm taking off my boots and everything, getting in my car. And they asked me, you know, what I'm doing. I said, I, well, I was here with somebody, you know, looking at some stuff. But I said, I'm leaving. I said, I'm not bothering anybody. And the guy goes, man, I wouldn't go in there. There's strange things in there. And I went, yeah, you're very right. And I never heard from that guy again. He wanted to do an interview with me one time, and it didn't work out. But it was like, yeah. Two years ago, I went on an overnight camp out in Arkansas. And we had walked around this little pond, you know, searching and things and putting up cameras and recorders and stuff in this area. And we was, oh, I'd say 10 miles from any, any little towns or any houses or anything. It was part of a wildlife management area, and we spent the night, a couple of nights there. But we're sitting by the fire, and we're all talking and everything. And one of the guys got a flare, so he's zooming around, just kind of looking to see if there's anything around us. And he sees I shine, and he sees a, a shape and everything. And he says, "There's something watching us." And it was like, okay. And we got up and kind of walked around a little bit. And as we went that way, well, it crawled off. He, he caught it on the flare crawling off and taken off. And it was like, okay. And we went back to camp. And about 20 minutes later, he went over that area again or pointed the flare in that area and caught the same shape. And a little shape also. And I was like, a little one? And he goes, yeah, a little one. And I was like, oh, this is going to be cool. And I went to my car, and I got a couple of little rubber balls, probably the size of a 50 cents piece. You know, not huge, but not little bitty tiny. And I just walked out in the woods and sat them in a tree and went back to camp. And they stayed. We caught signs of these two creatures a couple of more times, you know, kind of going around camp. And we had put cameras out. So if it had come in, anything had come into camp, we would have caught it. Well, my tent was on the kind of the you know, the outside of the, the campground where theirs was and everything. And I went to bed and about 30 minutes later, I heard something scraping up against the bottom of my tent, like it was filling of the tent. And I was like, oh, cool. Unfortunately, there wasn't a moon out. I couldn't see what it was or anything. But the next morning, I got up and walked around the tent and got to looking and went about 10 or 20 yards and found three little footprints that was about five inches long. You want to talk about somebody getting excited? Now I own my own flair. <laughs> Every time I get to go out, I learn something new about habits, about living in this world that they have to live in, where it's not safe, where people point guns at them and everything. And it makes me really want to just back off and be like it used to be. 
I've heard the stories of the old people in my family, my grandparents, who were from Germany, who spoke of the old people in their villages. And I thought at first they was talking, you know, about an old neighbor or something. But as I got older, I listened closer. And my grandfather would tell stories of since he was the the youngest boy, he always got to take a plate of food out into the yard and would place it on the well. And then after they had dinner and was doing dishes, he had to go back and look for the plate. And he would always find it on a fence post up high with no food on it. And it made me realize that maybe they were talking about these creatures because the way they looked at them back there. I wouldn't personally feed one. I don't think it's safe for them to come around on a regular basis. But the few mornings that I've walked outside of my house at five o'clock to go to work and they're hit with that smell. They're here. They're closer than anybody thinks they are. My Bigfoot sighting was in North Carolina, just south of Whittier, North Carolina, which is south of Franklin, North Carolina. And it'll be east of Bryson City, North Carolina. We had rented a cabin up in the mountains. Matter of fact, right on top of a mountain. This would have been in 2021. And the first time ever renting the cabin, seeing pictures of it, we got up there and got everything situated and decided to go rambling a little bit. I had the cabin rented for three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we rambled all day that Friday and uh, went and seen the elk and done a little tourist thing and all. Came back in about 10 o'clock. And so we were hungry, and she decided to fix us a little something to eat. So she fixed some grilled cheese and some soup. And uh, I cut the TV on to watch a little bit of TV. I think Gunsmoke was on. While she was in the kitchen, she heard something on the front porch. Called me in there. I went in there and looked out the window, and I didn't see anything. So we figured it was just a coon or something walking around or a possum or something out there, possibly a bear because we were in the mountains. But anyway, I went back in the living room, sat down on the couch. About that time, we heard something knock over on the porch. Something fell over. So I got up, went back in the kitchen, and looked out the window again. I didn't see anything. Well, she got scared to come back in there with me in the living room. And there's a big window there on front, looking out on the front porch. And uh, we heard cracking and stuff coming across the floor of the porch. And I got a little bit uneasy about it. And I went over where my pistol was. I had a pistol on the table and my phone on the lamp table. And I thought it was a bear about that time. And then here comes this thing grunting. It started grunting. He grunted three different times, real deep grunts. I mean, deeper than a hog or a bear. So we were both looking out the window, and there's a nightlight out there on a pole, and it shined toward the house and toward the porch. And, of course, the lamp was right there on the lamp table. It shined toward the window. Well, it came by the window, paused for a few seconds, looked in the window, and then walked right on back up into the mountain, I guess. But anyway... It had a uh, huge shoulders, hardly any neck. I couldn't see the face real well, but it had a nose. I could see a little bit of the nose, and the eyes had a red glow to them, like a light red glow. But right after that, what I wanted to do, the first thing come to my mind was pick the phone up and get a shot through the window. Then my better judgment said, no, pick the pistol up. So I picked the gun up. About the time it looked in the window when it went on by, and I had it loaded and everything. And we walked around just a few minutes, made sure all the doors were locked and curtains were pulled together and back. 
and cut every light on in the cabin and sit around a few minutes, cut the TV off, hoping we might hear it again if it, if it come around. But we didn't hear anything else. There was no other racket, no noise. But we didn't get any sleep all night. Sit up just about all night. I think she she finally went to sleep around three or four o'clock, dozed off a little while, but we were both just scared. I mean, it was just a, a awful feeling. I mean, of, of the unknown. I, I didn't know what to think. I just, it, it was just a real bad feeling. But the next morning, I told her that we don't need to stay there another night. So I went outside after we loaded up everything, I walked around, and there's huge rock croppings outside of the cabin around the porch and all. And it had rained that night, and I looked for tracks, but couldn't find any. I did find a big flower base that was knocked over on the porch, a big one. I couldn't find any tracks. I looked on the porch for mud or anything, didn't see any hair. So I guess it went on back up in the mountain. But anyway, I put the key in the box on the porch. We went and got us a whole motel room, got out up on top of that mountain. And you just about had to have four-wheel drive to get up there where we were at because it's right on top of a mountain close to the river. And anyway, we left, and just a bad experience for us. I, I don't think I want to see another creature like that for a long time. But anyway, that's the only experience I've ever had other than seeing a few tracks. I lived in right up in Winston County for 12 years, right in the Bankhead National Forest. And Cliff and I, a friend of mine who's already passed on, we got called by a deputy to go with them down to a farm right on the lake here, Smith Lake. She said they had been bear or something coming through there. That the people who owned the property said they'd been seeing something come through there at night. The lake was down real low, and ice was coming out of the ground so we were walking practically on ice out there on a sandbar right next to the lake we found three footprints two look like adults and another look like a little young and you know like nine or ten years old but the, the large track was 18 inches and the other track was about 16 inches or 14 inches and they were real wide cliff made some plaster parish cast out of them and that would have been, let's see, about 2010, 2009. And then I was an original member of the Patterson Bigfoot Club back in 1967 when I was a teenager. Got a card and a five or seven picture of Bigfoot. I still got the picture, by the way. Well, I lost my little card, and it was just a... Uh, like I say, just extremely bad experience for me and her. It upset us both. It took me a long time. I kept all my blinds closed in my house watching TV. I, I'd get up and look out the window sometimes after that, weeks after that, seeing if I could see anything. But the area I live in here, we've had uh, several experiences with the creatures here. There's a place here called Booger Holler. Back in uh, the 50s, there's a farmer who had a little mechanic shop there. It's way back over in the woods on a dirt road. Of course, they paid it now, but he had two grown hogs in the pen one night, and something took those hogs out of the pen, didn't come through the gate, didn't tear the fence up, took them out of the pen, took them about 50 yards from the pen, and just gutted them and pulled the legs off from the joints, the hindquarters, and just went off with them. Well, he had hound dogs, and they said they went and hunt, tried to hunt for whatever it was. They found these tracks that looked like bear tracks, but they didn't know what it was. This is back in the 50s. And then on the river here, the Tallapoosa River, I lived close to it. Back in the 60s, there were two guys hunting on Fox Creek down there. And the dogs were treeing, and they heard something come out of the woods. They looked over next to the river where the shows were, 
this big hairy thing it was like it's seven eight foot tall with his arms up in the air straight up in the air it was going across the river there at the shows it went right on across the river and got out of the river bank and went back up into the woods that's about all i can tell you about experiences around here other than what my cousin is seen i have a cousin that lives up in chillsburg they see all kind of things up there but Around here, that's about it, other than just a few hundred stories and all over in Coos County that have had some experience with them, with the yells and knocks and poops and all that stuff. But I get a little nervous just talking about this thing. It just, it's just unnervy. It's, it's an unknown fear. I just, I don't know. I don't think I want to go hunting one. But anyway. It's just a scary experience for me. And we have uh, some meetings here sometime up in the Hollands Wildlife Reserve. They had an incident up there where this hunter, a few years ago, uh, I think he's about 15 years ago, he came up missing. And uh, the family didn't know what happened. They knew that he went hunting, but he took a tree stand with him. And so they had called the sheriff's department and the rescue team. They found him two days later under a tree. His rifle hadn't been fired. His lower part of his body had been twisted, and one of his arms had been pulled out of socket. He was dead. But they never went public with it, like in the papers or anything, because they didn't want people coming in there. They figured uh, it had to be something really big. They didn't, the, some of the, the sheriff's department didn't think it was a big cat. They didn't think a bear would do that, so they put on his death certificate, unknown animal, killed by unknown animal. And there's a few other little instances happen around here, but not worth talking about, really. Just uh, some hollers and yells and whoops, different things like that. Anyway, it's a very scary thing. It's not something that you want in your life, I can tell you that right now. So that's about it on my experience with them. My Bigfoot sighting occurred in northwest Montana in 2013. It was in the Swan Range, which backs right up to the Bob Marshall Wilderness. And the Bob Marshall Wilderness is a million and a half acres without any roads or any buildings of any sort. It's just wilderness. It's rugged. It's mountainous. And it's very, very thick trees and brush. It's an amazing place. And this was in September We were getting ready, me, my husband at the time, and my three children and our dog were going up there to do some scouting for hunting season. Uh, Bow season starts the first week of September there. So we went up there. We brought our rifles to sight them in. We brought my bow. We brought the kids, and we were just making an outing of it. We decided we wanted to camp about mid-range in that Swan Valley. So we went up a road called Goat Creek. And Goat Creek is just a gravel road, lots of logging roads that are gated off. And we found our camping spot and it was getting pretty close to dark. So we set up camp real quick. We were just in tents. We didn't have a camper. It's still pretty warm in September. And I got dinner done, got the kids to bed. And as I was cleaning up camp, we heard this howl. It was a howl. It was a growl. It was this deep, resonant, just such a big noise. And it sounded like it was coming from about a half mile away. And I just paused what I was doing. The hair on the back of my neck stood up all over my arms, goosebumps. And I looked at my husband. I said, what was that? He says, I have no idea. Now, I grew up in Colorado and I've lived in Idaho, Montana and Oregon and have been an avid hunter and outdoors woman my whole life. I've hunted moose. I've hunted elk, deer, bear, 
and I'm familiar with the sounds that foxes make and cats make. And this was nothing like any of those. This was just such a bone chilling noise. And he says, I have no idea. And we didn't hear anything else for about 10 minutes. We went about our business and then we heard that same sound, only it was a half mile on the other side of us the second time. So we were in the middle and that was super spooky. And I was contemplating uh, moving camp spots, but it was so dark and the kids were already in bed. So we got the fire going up nice and big and we were just sitting by the campfire. We had our dog between us, Kazi, he's a pit bull. And we were just sitting there talking and had started to calm down, kind of let go of whatever those noises were. And all of the sudden, Kazi starts, that's my dog, he starts shaking and growling and I'm just trying to settle him down. He was he was kind of a strange dog in that way. And then I smelled this awful smell. And I thought, well, the kids need to stop feeding him snacks is what I thought. I thought it was my dog, this terrible smell. We kind of joked about it and continued our conversation. And Kazi, out of just a dead sleep, he had actually calmed down by that point just all of a sudden gives this very vicious growl, snarl, and leaps across the campfire. And I grab him by the collar. You know, I stand up. My husband stands up. What's going on? I pull my dog back and my husband goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and starts running for the vehicle. At this point, I hadn't really seen anything. I'm watching him. I'm going, what? 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 And I look up across the fire, and I'm a little night blind from that fire, but I see this massive, and it's just the outline, like I could see the firelight in the hair of of this creature. It, It was crouched down just outside the firelight. I could see, uh, that its face did not have any hair on it. This thing was massive. Just crouched down, it was massive. It was whiter than any bear I've ever seen, including a grizzly bear. And it just stood up and it just, as it stood up, it got taller and taller and taller. And I was like, wow. And my dog is snarling and shaking. And my husband, he gets one of our rifles out, he pops the clip in and he fires a shot into the air. And at that point, whatever this was, it just turns around. It looks at me, it makes eye contact, and it calmly just turns around and walks straight away from the camp into the brush. And then the strangest thing about that was as it headed away from us in this thick brush on a steep terrain, it made no sound. Bears, when they take off, they make sounds. When uh, any four-legged creature, deer, They all make noise, and even the smaller ones make noise running through the brush. So this thing was absolutely silent. Like, it knew where it was going. It was not aggressive, and it was not in a hurry. And the little bit of firelight I could see off of its face, which was a very human-looking face, was just one of curiosity more than anything. But, of course, we were pretty freaked out. And still not wanting to get the kids up and wrap up camp in the dark, wanting to stay close to the campfire, we realize that we are running low on camp wood and somebody's going to have to go scrounging around. We weren't planning to have a fire all night and that changed. So my husband gets in the truck. He leaves me there with the dog and the weapons. And he says, I'm going to just drive up and down the road and I'm going to grab whatever wood I find lying there and I'll be right back. And shoot, if anything is bothering you, let me know and I'll be right back. And I said, okay. So I'm sitting in the entrance of this tent with my dog who continues to tremble and growl in this, just this low growl more nervous, I think, than anything. And I don't know how long he was gone, not very long, 10 minutes maybe, and he comes flying back into camp. And he says, there is something out there throwing stuff at me. And I said, no, that's ridiculous. And he says, no, absolutely. As I was getting out of the truck to grab wood, something was throwing rocks at me. And I I was, okay. (laughs) So, We put all the wood that he had managed to grab on the fire, made it as big as possible, 
And both of us sat at the entrance of the tent with the dog and the kids behind us. We stayed up all night just sitting there and we did not hear anything or smell anything. After that point, we discussed everything we had seen. We compared stories to make sure that we had seen the same thing, that the events had unfolded the same way for both of us. And as the sun started to come up, we finally decided that it was safe enough for us to try and get a few hours sleep. So we did. We laid down for a few hours and when the sun was fully up and the kids started waking up, we wrapped up camp. We were not going to camp there another night. We were really, really freaked out about it. And of course, we didn't say anything to the kids at the time. They were very young. And when we we wrapped up camp, we decided, well, it's daytime. Let's still do some scouting for hunting season. And as we were like driving down Goat Creek to the main Swan Highway, we realized there is absolutely no game out here, which is very bizarre. That area is just prolific for white-tailed deer. You can get five or six tags at a time. It's just really, really odd to not see any game, especially at that hour of the day. And we decided we were not going to hunt that area at all that year. Going forward from that, I have gone back to that area many times, but I have never stayed the night. I've never camped there unless I was in my vehicle or in like a hard camper. And even then, it's pretty spooky out there. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves and the plow And the five-string melodies grooving With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music yeah The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track His pick-up man had been through it Getting through the day on Scruggs and Skaggs Booking a bells to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out music yeah Summer got me backwards backwards and double time looking at the soul and the tremor of Kentucky style those are the anthems drumming now country boy living when I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo The stereo's booming When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Summer going backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul and the tremolo Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out Country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down Best sweet tea, kind of sound.